I want to send a special thank you to ClayShare for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. Through their online ceramic education platform, they offer hundreds of full-length classes, as well as thousands of instructional videos that can be streamed straight to your smart TV or compatible device. They offer a wide range of topics that are perfect for the beginner to the experienced potter. With your membership, you'll receive weekly live tutorial broadcasts, access to virtual workshops with well-known artists, and special discounts on ceramic supplies. If you sign up today, use the offer code RAMBLER25 to receive a 25% discount on your first three months. For more information, check out ClayShare.com. Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 367 of the podcast. Thank you guys for tuning in. Today on the show, I talk with Juan Barroso about his pointless ceramic works. He often creates images of family members or objects from his childhood that tell immigrant narratives. In our interview, we talk about his handyman approach to art making, how pointillism stands in as a metaphor for labor, and how art can be a conduit for expressing emotion. If you'd like to see examples of Juan's work, you can visit his website. That's juanbarrosoart.com. I wanted to thank the folks that have been donating to our podcast. I'd like to thank Constance Bow and Don Katz for their recent contributions. If you'd like to get involved today and help support this show, you can do that at talesoveredclayrambler.com slash donate. Before we get to this interview, I also wanted to talk about the rise of anti-Asian violence in the U.S. It's a stark example of how xenophobia and white supremacist violence and action has become completely normalized in our country. I hope that you'll join me in committing to stand against this violence, and I know sometimes it can be hard to figure out what exactly to do. Thankfully, there is an organization called Hollaback who is offering free bystander intervention training as well as de-escalation training to help us learn how we can safely step in when we see violence. I've signed up for one of their free trainings in the next couple weeks, and I hope you will do so as well. You can find out more information about that at iHollaback.org slash bystander intervention. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. Let's start talking about your your thesis exhibition. Can you talk a little bit about the work that you made specifically for that show? The gallery is split into two different rooms with a wall in between them. And I, I made an installation of 263 water jugs to split one of the rooms, forcing people to have to walk around and go into the other room in order to see the other half of my uh, thesis show. And so the, the water jug wall served as a, a kind of like metaphorical border. And the show itself was talking about my experiences both in Mexico at the border and on the U.S. side of the border. Yeah, let's focus on the wall first, because I know there were also um, some ceramic, other ceramic forms. Can you talk about how the water jug reads as an individual object and then how it reads when it's in a wall, like when they're stacked up like that with the, the skull and that reference. And individually, the water jugs, to me, um, remind me of a video I saw of an ice officer dumping out the water jugs that humanitarian groups, uh, I think it was the humanitarian group No More Deaths, that they would leave behind for people trying to cross the, the desert so they wouldn't die from dehydration. He was asking these people if they was theirs, and if they said yes, he was going to arrest them for littering. 
I read at the time a study that found that water jug placement didn't mean undocumented immigrants would take those routes. There wasn't a map of water jug placements to follow in order to make it easier to cross the border. They were there to save people from dying. So to have this officer dumping out the water jugs to me felt like condemning people to death for no reason. So the water jug became a response to that. The quantity of the water jugs in this wall, 263, was for the number of deaths that happened in the year 1999, the same year that my father tried to cross the border. They were undocumented immigrants until I turned 21. And so this year was pretty significant to my, my father. He uh, attempted to cross and was riding the back of somebody's truck that had gasoline containers. The heat of the sun in the desert made the gasoline containers catch on fire. And he was forced to jump out. These guys thought the gasoline containers were uh, lit on purpose and started shooting at my father and the other men in the back of his truck. He was forced to walk back uh, with burned feet all the way home. And as a kid, I remember mostly just seeing his feet dangling off of the bed. So this, uh, this year is significant uh, to my family. Now I understand what happened that, that year. As a kid, I didn't quite really know what was going on. Yeah, I think as children, we often you know, don't understand what our, what our parents were doing. Was there a conversation about why he was going to leave and then why he was back? Uh, I don't remember that part. I don't remember him explaining why he had to come back until way later. I just knew he was hurt. Uh, so the reason for leaving... Uh, we just weren't making it in Mexico. We were struggling to eat. And so he wanted to work in the U.S. to send some money back. Can you talk about the influence of having a family member that becomes a character in your work? Because in, in one way, they're, it's your dad, like it's a real life person. But then also in your artwork, he becomes a, something that recurs in multiple pieces. I think uh, our family story isn't just a unique story. If we talk to other friends, they have similar stories of people they've uh, come across. And I remember once my dad talking about on one of the attempts to cross the border, he had to leave two women behind on a ditch that he couldn't save. As he talked to my aunts about this, it seems like such a normal thing. And on the inside, I was freaking out. Like, why would that be such a normal thing to just talk about? So at the time, it felt kind of cold. But it was this acceptance of the, it just being the way it is, I guess. So, yeah, he becomes a character for, I think, a really common narrative. Yeah, and let, let's bring in the conversation. I can't remember the name of the piece, but it was something relating to the things that I cry about when I drink. Oh, yes, that's, uh, um, I think, about eight flats with symbols and images of some of these um, personal stories of my life in Mexico and my life in the U.S. In the exhibition, they were on either side of the room, which is, you know, bisected by the wall. So can you talk about how you decide which form, like the, the wall of water jugs, it tells its story on its own. But then with the, um, the other piece with the flasks, what was the choice of the flask? Like what is significant about that specific thing as the vehicle for the drawing? In, in Mexican culture, there's still this idea of machismo, of like kind of not really showing your emotions very well. And it's something I don't really like. And my family and the men in my family have been so much better about that. But there was a time when I was younger when they would only talk about their feelings when they were drunk. They would tell me that they loved me, that they were proud of me. And it seemed like alcohol and honesty were tied together. And so that, that's the choice for those, those flats. Uh, some of the thoughts that I have, some of the memories I think about whenever I, I drink myself. And so, for example, on one of them, I had the image of one of my, uh, like a man with a, a brown bag up to his face. On one of the times I went back to Mexico after my parents became legal residents, I met an old friend who I met in the basketball courts. And I, I beat him so bad at this basketball game, not because I was good, but because he was high off of this brown glue that they don't even sell in the U.S. It's so bad for you. He was telling me, oh, I don't, I don't smell that glue stuff anymore. And uh, you could smell it on him. He was like falling over. The thought that I could have been like this guy if I had stayed back in Mexico hurt me pretty bad. I would like to think I would have been a better example to my friends and stuff. And it's very likely that I might have ended up right there along with them. So that's one of the images of one of the flasks. 
And there are similar things like that that just kind of made me grateful to be where I am today in the U.S., where it is easier to make a living and actually eat. Yeah, when did you come to the States? I came here for, I think, the start of third grade. I had to learn English, and so English is my second language. And it wasn't until I turned 21 that I could uh, go back to, to Mexico. I'd say I kind of grew up there, and it's where... I guess my my values and, and my Mexican identity were established. I lived there long enough to consider myself Mexican. You've been in undergrad and grad school for ceramics, but specifically your grad time coincided with uh, the Trump presidency, which was the most aggressive anti-immigration policy. Well, it's hard to say. He was the most visibly anti-immigration. Our immigration policies aren't great in my whole lifetime. So it's not just him, but he was, you know, wanted to build a wall. He, he had this very aggressive tendency. So when you started to make work about ceramics, how did the political leader of the U.S. or the political leaders in Mexico, like how did that affect the way you understood that situation politically versus your actual experience of being an immigrant? Yes, that's a very good question. I think uh, quite a bit of my work felt like a reaction to some of the things that he was saying. The fact that I think even the documents uh, along the, the border for these, uh, like for ICE had to be changed to aliens, I believe, instead of undocumented immigrants. You know, it really made me mad. The, the idea that officers had to purposefully dehumanize immigrants. And so, I, th I would say that my work became a reaction in an attempt to humanize the immigrant, show that we're not just some kind of foreign invader of some sort. Yeah, I was I was talking to um, Masa Sasaki, who uh, is a Japanese man that is a potter that lives in Atlanta, and he's done a lot of work around that concept of the alien, like the alien identif. I think it's alien identification card. There's some document you have to have that has the word alien printed on it and just how weird that is for an adult, but much less for a kid, you know, cause we think about like as children, words have strange meanings. Like, you know, alien is something you see in sci-fi, but then when you're a kid and someone says you're an alien or, you know, however it's referred to, that's, that is a weird dilemma, I think, in the mind of a child. Yeah, I'd say so. I can't imagine what some of these kids behind the chain link fences are feeling about themselves. I think had I been in a situation like that, it would have been pretty bad for my self-esteem. I think having to learn English and, and, and maybe adjust to life here in the U.S. was already hard enough as a kid. Um, I can't imagine what that, that would be like, how it's going to affect them. Yeah, let's let's talk about the imagery of the chain link fence. That's something that, that comes up in, um, in your work over and over again. Can you talk about what that symbol means and why you depict, often you'll depict the hands, you know, like someone grasping the fence. So can you talk about the use of that symbol, but then how you choose to depict that on the objects, on the pots or the sculptures? Uh, yeah, so I saw some videos that people took, uh, even though they weren't supposed to, some of these detention centers of kids with these like foil blankets and some were even dying from dehydration. I read an article about all the cases of rapes happening to these kids as well. And it, it was very heartbreaking. So I use this hand on the chain link fence to talk about the uh, living conditions in these attention centers. Something that was happening even during Obama's presidency and I just hadn't noticed, unfortunately. It wasn't until I think Trump when people started to notice what was really going on. Yeah, I saw this video of a kid who also was uh, having some kind of attack and he was crawling towards the door. And um, at the same time, these officers were just kind of sitting watching their computers, not really doing anything. It's heartbreaking and it kind of makes me mad how much money is spent in these places and then they don't use that money on these kids. So yeah, it's a, it's a pretty common, common thing. And it's hard to consider these kids aliens whenever you see an image like that. And I think that's the point. Yeah, I feel like a lot of our political um, turmoil in the U.S., it's it's adults yelling at adults. But somehow when you see that, no, this is children, this is not a political ideal, like this is the life of a kid, it's so obviously heartbreaking. I, I, I actually don't understand how the politicians don't also find it heartbreaking. Yeah, I'd say so. 
on the other on the Mexico side of the the installation, water jug installation, I also have some water jugs with razor wire. Something I noticed is that uh, Trump ordered for more concertina wire to be put up on the border wall. My mother had sent me a photo of this woman and her child who got really cut up in their attempt to cross the border. I think the the hope of the American dream and, and a better life um, makes some people think it's, it's worth risking their lives and even their health. And to see these images of the bloody child and, and her mom uh, was also heartbreaking. And so one of those pieces of my thesis show was a response to those images, how much people are, and immigrants are willing to pay for a better life. When I think about your work, there's the story of people coming to the U.S., but then you're also telling the story of um, labor with people once they're here. So one of the things that was this mop bucket that was hand-built, and then there's a drawing on the side of that. Can you talk about choosing that object and, and what that means in the show? Uh, yeah, one of the nice things about grad school was um, my professor, Brooks Oliver, really tried to get me to put the image and the form together so it'd be a strong, it'd be stronger conceptually. So I put this janitor image on one side of the mop bucket to talk about maybe the overlooked or underappreciated labor of janitors in schools. When I was uh, going to school here in Princeton, I noticed how the kids would sometimes ignore or even kind of make fun of the janitors. And it kind of hit home a little bit more because my mom was cleaning houses at this time to provide for my family. So she would have this like neon pink sign on the back of her car that said Lucy's house cleaning. And after seeing how kids would treat the janitors, I would ask my mom to pick me up a little bit further away from the school. I I admit I was, I was embarrassed and maybe ashamed of, of what my mom was doing because of that. And it wasn't until I worked at Michael's on the sales floor and then mopping and cleaning the restrooms that I realized there's there's quite a bit of dignity to to this work. And I, I felt bad for, for being embarrassed when I was younger. And so it was also a way to kind of apologize to my mom and honor her, her own work and what she did to provide for my family. Yeah. What did she think of the work when she saw it? Oh, she she loved it. <laughs> I didn't tell her this this other reason, of course, of but I think she knew. Yeah. And then interesting how our parents generally love anything that we do. So when you think about like early, like you, we haven't talked about this yet, but you're a painter, you can draw, you're a ceramic artist, like you're, you're a multi-talented maker. So in the beginning, when you're making images of things she can relate to, there was probably a sense of pride I would imagine from her. But then now when you're making work that's political does she talk to you differently about the work as your work has gotten more political? No, I think I think she's still pretty proud of, of the work, and I think she she knows that it's important. And whenever she seems sees some articles that are talking about uh, the border, she sends them over to me. So she's she's been trying to help, and I notice she even tells me more stories. Uh, it's like she's trying to give me more more ideas as well. So that's that's been nice. Both my parents they they talk about their childhood and their memories quite a bit more. Yeah, what part of Mexico are they from? San Miguel Loctopan, Guanajuato. I believe it's a few hours west of Mexico City. I wanted to talk to you about how your creative path has changed based on your uh, parents' immigration status and how, like I heard you say in an interview that before they became, is, is the term legal resident? What's the, what's the term once you get documented? Yeah, I think it's just like a resident of the United States. Once you become a permanent resident, that you as the child of your parents, you felt like you could be more open about telling their story and telling general stories about immigration as to where before that, there was some fear in the back of your head, like, I can't make artwork about this because what if this leads to some repercussion? Yeah, I grew up scared of uh, maybe standing out a bit too much, calling attention to my parents' status. Um, I think even their accents would scare me. So I would try and, and speak for them most of the time, even when ordering food. So it was this constant fear that we were always like a ticket away from deportation and, and my, our lives changing right away. So the point was really to blend in, to just hide. And the moment they became legal residents, it felt like a weight was lifted. 
the freedom to actually be honest and, and talk about our experiences and my pride in, in Mexican culture and our values. It was a great moment to finally feel free. Yeah, that fear, like that ongoing fear in the back of your head, like thinking that your parents might be discovered or, or that you would be discovered, however that fear manifests, now that you're a couple years away from that, you know, you've gotten older, how do you think about the fear itself? I'm still grateful, I would say. I'm very grateful that it's not really there every day. I have more peace of mind, and I think maybe that's probably the thing that was lacking back then. There's always this kind of like, always be careful every day kind of thing going on. That's it's pretty great, I'd say. Looking back, I haven't really been afraid of my parents being deported in, in a while. And and I feel more confident in talking about their, their status and, and our stories. And that's been really nice. I think I, for a while I was avoiding talking about all of that as well. I was making the work, but not really talking about it, I would say. You mentioned that pointillism, or, or I've, I've seen your work and I've heard you talk about your attraction to pointillism as being an equivalency to time. So when you're looking at a pot and you see all those dots, you're intentionally putting labor into the object. So can you talk about that as a philosophical choice? For that, I'd like to use a story of a bicycle pilgrimage with my dad on the second trip we went back. So there's a 180 mile, 60 miles a day bicycle pilgrimage to see the Virgin of Guadalupe. Um, people go to ask for forgiveness, to ask for a miracle, or just to be grateful and, and say thank you. And it's um, it's a journey that is, is very difficult. I trained uh, in Oklahoma City. I could do 30 miles uh, in a day, but I didn't realize Mexico, Mexico would have these huge hills. So 30 miles in Oklahoma City felt like five in Mexico. So then I end up having to do 60, and I, I felt like I was going to faint a couple of times. Uh, to see these grown men still riding despite feeling like they're about to fall over was very inspiring to me. I think the, maybe the soul of the Mexican people is in their resilience, this will to keep going despite their, their pain. And so this, this trip, the journey felt a lot more significant than the final destination than seeing the Virgin of Guadalupe's image. I know that might sound bad, but by the time I got there, I felt I was with her more along the journey than when finally being in front of her image. And so when someone asked me, you know, like, why not just, um, why, why not just put a decal on there? My answer at the time was, it'd be like asking one of these bicycle pilgrim pilgrims, why not just take a truck? Why not get there in three hours instead of 60 miles a day on a bicycle for three days? I think the, the journey was more significant than getting there. And so to use the dots, I feel is a way to put all this devotion and love into an image that I care about. And I think that shows. And now that I have been working on decals, um, I want to use those to make a more affordable and accessible body of work because the dots take so long, some people are not find it hard to afford the, the work and, and they would like to be supportive, including my family. So I've accepted the decals as, as, a, as a way to still produce work and make it accessible to people that I care about. When you're thinking about holding an object, like I was seeing a, a picture of you working, you have a magnifying glass that's kind of in front of you or in between you and the, the object, and you're putting those dots. How do you judge the scale of color? Because I know for me, when we're look, when we're working on ceramics and I'm really close to the pot, it looks so different than if you're 10 feet away. So how do you know when you've gotten enough dots to get that scale or that richness of color you're wanting? That's a good question. So working with a magnifying glass, I've noticed my dots have been getting smaller, which, you know, a six hour piece is taking up to like 16, sometimes 12. So the magnifying glass actually makes it easier to get the spacing of the dots more correct and it's also saving my eyes a bit after years of doing this my right eye was hurting part of that was not having the right prescription of glasses so i corrected that um <laughs> but yeah the magnifying glasses to try and protect my my eyes a little bit longer so i can keep doing this and i've been starting to use a, a like a, um, an easy eraser wrapped along the tip of the brush to protect my hands as well I noticed that after painting maybe four hours, my hands and wrists would start to hurt, 
which for a bit became part of that kind of self-sacrifice and, and labor put into the piece. But now that I'm thinking about doing this for longer, I'm, I'm trying to protect those hands. There's no reason they should be hurting. And so now I can paint for longer um, with just like a, some kind of gripper along the brush. So that's just like literally like a foam mm-hmm. little thing you slide on there. It makes it easier to hold. Yeah, I'm using the, um, either like a piece of foam, sometimes electrical tape, uh, my needed eraser, like the bubblegum looking erasers. And lately I was using oil-based clay. It's a little bit more stiff. And as you work, it starts to kind of soften up and it takes the shape of your fingers a little bit better. Yeah, I do a lot of painting as well on, on my pots. And one thing I've found that's so hard mentally is to tell myself to relax my hand. Because I'll, as I get more intense in what I'm doing, like focused, I slowly start to grip harder and harder and harder. And I'll look down and I'll literally look like I got white knuckles, you know, like that, that saying white knuckling it. And it's, that's so bad for your hand. Uh, I'm glad you understand that. That's why I started adding the gripper. And I noticed that I would clench my right hand to keep my left hand steady from my dots. And my right hand was actually hurting more than my left. And so now I grip like a foam ball or I keep my hand, my right hand open. I'm trying to be very aware of what the other hand is doing because yeah, I think to study myself, I'm progressively maybe gripping or like, yeah, clenching my hands a little bit more. When you paint, are you painting on, on the pots at least, are they uh, tilted or are they upright? Because one thing I've seen people do in China when I was living there is they would put the pot, they would, so you had a desk and then they pull a drawer out of the desk and then put the pot horizontal to the desk with foam. So then they could draw basically with their elbow at a 90 degree angle, as opposed to holding it like a 30 degree angle. So what, what angle do you paint at? That's the most comfortable for your body. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so I use a scarf to get the correct angle to where it's facing me. And I guess it'd be like the, the, the surface of the piece is directly facing me, but I'm looking down at a, maybe like, would it be a 45 degree angle or so? Sure, sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and the, the scarf I use to protect the other side of the piece, just so it doesn't smudge or anything. Yeah, I've been using a lot of scarves lately. Yeah, that's smart. It's almost like a sling that it's holding it in there. Yeah. And I guess because un- you're using underglaze, right? Yes, of course. Okay, so then that way it's not going to smudge if that scar- scarf rubs up against it. Mm-hmm. So when you think about the pieces um, that are image driven, so let's let's imagine those flasks again. You know, like the flask is you know probably this big, and the image takes up a lot of that picture plane of the flask. That's such a different way to convey information because it makes the pot have one side. So how do you make images, two dimensional images that that still accentuate the three dimensional aspect of the object, whatever you're painting on? That has probably been the hardest thing to figure out on some of these. On the water jugs, um, on the most recent one, I drew it to where it would look right from one specific angle. And if you like, move to the side, the proportions of the fingers start to kind of widen a little bit. And so there, um, I try to ignore the form, whereas in other, at other times, I kind of paint along the, the curves of the piece. The nice thing about, I think, a vessel is that you can have multiple images on there that wrap around and still maintain a decent composition, whereas on a piece of paper, I think it's easier to notice when something is kind of maybe too at center or too far to the side. And so, at least to me, it seems like a vessel, a three-dimensional vessel seems to be a lot easier and maybe forgiving as far as compositions of images. For something like the mop bucket, I wanted to make the image small enough to where it'd be hard to find. Uh, just to talk about this overlooked labor of, of the janitors. So in that case, I think the image fit the concept. And where I saw the times, I, I do want the image to be noticeable and be the first thing you see. And in those cases, I would consider the, the form more of a canvas than a sculpture, if that makes sense. It does, yeah. Yeah, and we've, you know, we're talking ceramics because this is a ceramic podcast, but you're you're a painter, you can weave, you make sculpture. Like for instance, the chess set that was in your grad show, like that is not image driven. You know, that's really form. 
can you talk about how your creativity changes as you change medium and also how like ceramics you've been doing a long time. So you have mastery in that specific thing. So how does your creativity change in a different medium? If it's new, say like with weaving, which you haven't been doing as long. So a lot of the times when I see a photo, it almost seems to tell me what medium it wants to exist in. And so like I see a photo, I'm like, Oh, that's a soft pastel. That's going to be an oil painting. That one wants to be a graphite drawing. That one will be on a pot. It's this weird thing where I think the image tells me what it wants to be. And I'm happy enough that I've practiced with these other mediums to where I can make that happen. And so this image can exist in its best state, I suppose. And with the, the woven work, uh, it's, it's a chance to use more color. And it reminds me of the, the embroidery, the sewing my mom would do to provide for my sister and I while we were in Mexico. So it's a way to stay connected to her. It's a way to stay connected to uh, my ex-girlfriend who passed away in September, uh, September 15th of this last year. She taught me how to knit, which then got me closer to my mom because she also would knit. And so, yeah, the, I think the fiber work is a way to honor both my, my, my girlfriend and, and my mom. And now I've started to use some of the, the colors on, on pots as well. So they're kind of all blending together. Do you mind me asking you questions about your girlfriend? No, it's okay. So the thing about weaving is, is that it's, it's very labor intensive, but in a different way than making dots. So when you think about paying homage to her, how does weaving like that act? It's still physical. Like how does that physical act you think pay homage to her? She, she made me a knitted blanket that took about two years. And I received it a few weeks before she passed away. It's what uh, provides me some comfort now and I sleep with it every night. And so that repetition to imagine her constantly knitting a repetitive motion while maybe she's watching TV or something, it's labor of love. And so to, to use yarn and, and weaving, it kind of makes me think about her quite a bit. Isn't it interesting how we have tactile memories? You know, like that that tactile sensation of yarn now becomes a representation of her. Like, I, I, I know what you mean. Like, I'm familiar with that. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a way to stay uh, close to her. Yeah, do you think that you'll make work about her going forward? Oh, yeah. I've, I've already painted her with oil paints once and a soft pastel drawing. I included her... My new signature for my ceramic work is two little penguins. She used to love penguins, and I've included her in my signature. And so, in a way, she's in every pot that I make from now on. So I wanted to also think about and, and talk about how you think about being a handyman with art. In another interview, you said, I want to be the Mexican handyman of art making, which I thought was a very specific reference. <laughs> so can you talk about thinking about the handyman and what that means, like as you as a maker, what that means to you. Early on when my parents were still undocumented, my dad would go to a street corner in McKinney, Texas to ask for a day's uh, labor, a day's job. And he told me once that the guys that would get the, the work would be the ones that could do it all. The first ones to volunteer and that could do tile work. They could do like, they could be concrete finishers. They could make fences, do uh, sprinkler systems, um, all sorts of jobs. And so I don't think I, I know of a single construction job that my dad can't do at, at, the, at the moment. And I think I always wanted to grow up to be like him to where, I, you know, but with, with different mediums in art, I suppose. It was a way to be just like him, but in my own way. And so early on, I would experiment with all sorts of mediums. I did penny work, some wood burning, uh, colored pencil, soft pastel, charcoal, white chalk. Um, you can even technically draw with rocks. They leave a white outline on concrete. I did a little bit of that while like during lunch breaks, making fences with him. There's, there's, uh, I did a lipstick uh, painting once. How did that work? It worked out. It's still pretty wet though. <laughs> that stuff doesn't dry. <laughs> Yeah, I guess so. Cause it like the idea is it kind of looks glossy on someone's lips. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that stuff. If you touch it, you still get lipstick on your hands. It's, <laughs> it's been years. Uh, that's that's weird stuff. 
<laughs> I think most of the work that I've seen of yours and other materials has been very refined, you know? So if it's, if it's, if it's good enough, quote unquote, in your mind to put on your website, then it's like, like you've got serious painting chops. So everything on there is good. So can you talk about failure? Like when you're trying out a new material, how you think about what you're going to show to people and what you're just going to throw out? So usually the first piece is probably a failure on a new medium. And I just don't show that one. My dad had this rule when learning a new uh, new technique or a new, new thing. Uh, for example, for the tile work, he asked a friend of ours to come and do the tile in the living room so my dad could watch and figure out how it works. Um, he then tried it on his own for our bathroom and it's so, so, <laughs> <laughs> so that one, he didn't take any photos of that work. He, you know, he, he kind of, we kind of hide that one, but after that, everything else had the craftsmanship and quality that I think he was looking for. So you get one chance, I think is the way he, he kind of phrases it. And then you just kind of hide that one. <laughs> Do you give him a hard time? <laughs> about the bathroom <laughs> oh yeah yeah <laughs> so i kind of approach it that way i do like a, a trial piece with a new medium i toss it and then the next one should should be you know you got to learn from the mistakes right away just like a handyman would and then you got to do it right the next time yeah when i think about the handyman i think about that chess set that you made for the the show it's parts of pvc or it's i guess it's castings of parts of pvc so can you talk about that, like what that reference is re re related to labor? Oh, yeah. So while well, making fences with my dad, sometimes while digging the holes for the fence post, we would hit a PVC line. And to avoid making the homeowners mad, he had all sorts of PVC pipes in his toolbox to quickly repair it before we got fired. <laughs> and so this idea of always being prepared is kind of really has been there from from the start from working with with my dad the idea that he has to learn how to do all these things and fix mistakes right away is there how how much detail he would put into uh, picking out the fence pickets leveling the post all of that stuff i think translated over to just the detail and and time invested in my work so why the game of chess like what is oh, it about right. chess right the chess so uh, it's made from slip cast PVC parts. And the reason for the chess game is that most of the men on my mom's side of the family are chess players. My grandpa had to learn how to read and, and write based, uh, by, on his own. He didn't go to school. And to see him play chess with my uncles, the, you, you know this guy's a really intelligent man to, to le learn all these things on his own. And, and the way he plays is, is beautiful. It seems like a dance. And so it's always it's always great to see him playing, and, and they would you know, play during their lunch breaks, and we play every Wednesday. It's a way to it was a way to honor my grandpa, to talk about how intelligent he is, how far he's come, and to talk about maybe like, what we yeah, had the lunch break game as opposed to doing something else. Like these men choose to play chess, something that I think um, I don't know maybe you wouldn't expect that from these guys. Did you see the Queen's Gambit? Oh, yeah. I love the scenes where it's the older Russian men that are just doing the same thing. They're like out, you know, just hanging out in the park playing chess. Because she, you know, she's like a mega brain and she's playing in these big tournaments. But it's the guys out on the street that are like so focused on what they're doing. It was That was a cool shot. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was, a, it was a pretty great show. Made me think of my, my grandpa for sure as well. So recently you did a little mini residency at the Companion Gallery. Can you talk about forming a relationship with them? Because I noticed in your CV you've been showing with them for a while. And then what you were working on in that residency. Yeah. Um, so the first piece that I ever had, the first ceramic piece I had in a show was for the Last Call 2 show at Companion Gallery. And since it was the first show that I had a ceramic piece in, my parents drove up there with me to meet Eric. And he said he liked my work and that he would keep an eye on, on, on my work. And then he invited me to be in the collaborative companions show, uh, maybe a few years after that. And then we, it would you know, draw from a hat to see who you would have to collaborate with. And it turns out that I'd be collaborating with him. 
And from there, we, we had a conversation to figure out what we had in common. And that seemed to be the basis of the imagery of our collaborative pieces. That conversation, I think, helped us become closer. And we, uh, we're pretty good friends now. And that slowly, you know, kind of transitioned to him asking if, if uh, he could represent my work. And yeah, now, now I'm uh, selling through Companion Gallery. And so I went to do the short-term residency recently to experiment with color and decals. I, I had been thinking for a while of how to make my work more accessible. And, and that was the purpose, to find this answer to, to this, this problem that my, even my own family could not really afford my own pieces. Um, and so I was trying out decals and the way to make it my own was to do a hand, a free-handed drawing of the images, take a photograph of that and then use those to make these decals. So it wouldn't just be from a photo that I then, you know, put on the piece. It was from an original uh, drawing. This way it's still, it's still mine and it's still my work. And it would make, I think, a bit more special. And so all of the pieces, even though they have the, the same like drawings, I'm changing the color and the placement to where I think most of them are still pretty unique. Yeah, I noticed with that work too, at least what's on the Comedian website right now, is is that the way you're thinking about image on the round is changing. So I know with decals, you know, like you're you're putting it in one specific spot, but you also had some cups in there that it was the round side of a cup and it and almost told a complete narrative as you turn the cup around. And I think it was a guitar player. Uh, do you know which cup I'm talking about? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, tell me that story because it was a narrative in the round. Okay, so at first... Uh, when I was an undergrad in painting images, my professor, Stuart Asprey, who helped me uh, be okay with talking about immigrants and Mexican labor and my parents' uh, legal status, I owe a great debt to him for that. And he gave me also a healthy fear of empty spaces. <laughs> so all of my stuff had images wrapped around. And the more I did this, the longer my images would take to the point where if I were to hand paint images all the way around the prices would have to be 400 to 600 dollars and i have a mug that i did in honor of brie my girlfriend um that in value is about 750 in just time invested i won't be selling this mug of course because i knew it was for her and so i, I put images all the way around but the the decal provides me with a way to put images all the way around again to uh, speak of a more complex narrative without having to increase the price to over 600 just to get, you know, a decent wage out of it. And so I'm very excited about that aspect of decals. I can, I can wrap images around again and still have them accessible and affordable. And that's, that's very exciting to me. So this piece, um, I started it at, at a two week workshop in Penland and it's based off of the, the love songs that my, the men, the men on my mom's side of the family sing during parties, they all play guitar. Maybe with the exception of one or two, but most of the men play the guitar. And so during the parties, they sing all these like heartbreaking songs about love and and like not wanting your dad to to get old and just very like kind of moving uh, music. And so I painted my great grandpa on there and I painted guitar, I painted time. And it's all these, it's about these like fear of death and time passing and, and the love songs that they sing. It felt like a, a cup to honor the men in my family. And I'm thinking of doing one for the, for the women soon as well. But yeah, that, that, was, that was a really nice piece to paint. And I, I really invested time to wrap the images around on that one. Let's talk about heartbreaking music. Because that, uh, that style of music, that folk, that uh, somehow it has parts of polka music, which I've never quite been able to figure that out. Like what, what's the connection, the beat? You know that beat? Do you know? Like what, why is there a connection there? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's so random, but it's but that sound sets up this style of singing that's very emotional. You know, like yeah. it is it is emotive to the max, like up to level ten. <laughs> so talk to me about that, like in terms of hearing that now or hearing it growing up. Whenever you first heard that, how did you understand that that sorrowful sound? You know, I, at first, like I would hear them play the songs and stuff, and I couldn't relate as much, you know, but as soon as I got my first heartbreak, all of a sudden these made sense. It felt <laughs> like the, the guitarist could cry for me, you know, 
and in a culture where you're not supposed to show like it feel you feel kind of stressed about showing your emotions a little bit it felt like the guitar was a way to vent and actually express yourself and so that's how the men in my mom's side of the family found a way to kind of express themselves with music i guess yeah it, i think that's how i found it hearing them and being like you know i feel this this yeah they've been through some stuff and it made it easier to talk about my own experiences to them and there's a way to connect with family this is a totally different style of music but bluegrass has some which is where i'm from in the mountains of virginia a couple generations back all the men also played every instrument like the first time my dad told me we have this old dulcimer it's a it's a mountain instrument you play it on your lap do you, do you know what that is um i think so yeah you strum it kind of horizontally and yeah. we we have a handmade one it, it was just in our house and and I was like, Dad, what how what is this instrument for one? And what's the story with this? And he started talking about his I think it was his great grandfather could play any stringed instrument. And there's this thing in bluegrass music where there's often these songs that are super sad, but the sound is not sad. You know, like it's banjos, mandolins, guitars, like the sound can be kind of upbeat, but then the lyrics are so just emotional. But that's the connection you you said is that these men that were very stoic, no emotion, when they pick up the instrument, it's a whole different world. And I never put that together until you just said that. So it's interesting how music can play that role for people. Yeah, it took me a little bit for me to kind of find that. Yeah, and it seems like that your pots or your art, you know, your paintings too, like in some ways, like I don't know you you that well, but you're you're very composed, <laughs> but then the work is more emotional than you are. So, do you see a similarity there? Yeah, I would say so. They function as a kind of therapy, some way to kind of find peace, at least for the moment, in response to something. And so, yeah, it's, it's definitely how I express myself and how I find some kind of peace, I guess. So that work you made at Companion, did you leave that for sale there, or what? What happened to that work? Oh, yes. It'll be part of a solo show in the spring coming up in a few weeks. We haven't set a date on it just because I'm painting a few more um, hand-painted pieces to include. I'm hoping to add another five or six to it. But yeah, that'll be up on Companion Gallery soon. And I'll have different tiers. It'll be the pointillism work, the watercolor painted work, and the decal work, as well as some uh, low-relief carved pint glasses with um, mariachi skeleton images on there. Man, you do it all. Like you literally carve, paint, decal. It's it's inspiring because I feel like over the years I've whittled down what I do as a way to get better at it. But you seem to get better at everything <laughs> at the same time as it progresses. <laughs> Thank you. I, I appreciate that. That's, that's very kind. <laughs> it's that handyman mentality there again, I think. Well, to wrap up, can you leave um, your social media and then also your website so people can see the work we've been talking about? Oh, sure. So my website is uh, juanbarrosoart.com, J-U-A-N-B-A-R-R-O-S-O-A-R-T.com. And my Instagram handle is juan-barroso-art. Well, thanks, man. It's been a pleasure to chat. It was good to meet you. You as well. Thank you. I'd like to thank Juan for taking the time to do this interview. It was a pleasure to chat with him and to hear about his upcoming exhibition at the Companion Gallery. You can find out more information about that at companiongallery.com. Also, I wanted to thank ClayShare for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. They are an online ceramic education platform that offers hundreds of full-length classes that you can stream straight to your smart TV or compatible device. If you'd like to sign up, use the offer code RAMBLER25 and receive a 25% discount on your first three months of membership. To sign up today, visit clayshare.com. Before we go, I also wanted to do one more plug for Hollaback's Bystander Intervention Training. This is a way for you to learn how to safely step in when you see violence happening. If you would like to sign up for their free trainings, you can go to ihalaback.org slash bystander intervention. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you guys for tuning in.
If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. <laughs>